ahead for digital citizenship and open government. Uh, with the federal government in stagnation mode, I think more and more is going to start following, falling on the on the hands of our of our friends and state legislatures all over the country. Uh, you know, the United States government hasn't really passed a budget in very long, and so more and more responsibilities are going to be coming on on these folks who many of them have other jobs, and, and uh, so they're going to really need to be reliant uh, on their constituents to help them uh, be informed on these things. And so they didn't have tools like this back then, and so I think we're entering into a new era of digital politics. So I'm going to ask the, the panelists to come on up here and uh, join, uh, join me, and uh, we'll get going. By the way, we've got some um, uh, little sheets of paper if you have a question that you, that you would like. Uh, since we've got it videotaped, and shout out to everybody that's watching, uh, streaming across the country. But in order to not uh, interrupt those things, we, we, we opted to pass out these papers. So uh, you can get it to uh, our friends back there, uh, should you have any questions. And we've got a couple prepared, and then we'll get right down into it. So without much further ado, our first panelist is Matt Waite. Matt is a professor of practice in the College of Journalism and Mass Communications here at the University of Nebraska. He won a Pulitzer Prize for his work at Political Fact, PolitiFact, excuse me, the first website awarded a Pulitzer for national reporting. He began his journalism career writing for newspapers in Arkansas and Florida. Matt, thank you so much. Happy thank to you. be here. Our next panelist is Senator Laura Ebke. Senator Laura Ebke was first elected to represent District 32 in the Nebraska Legislature in 2014. Congratulations. Uh, she, has just, she has served as a member of the Crete School Board since 2002. Senator Ebke earned her PhD in political science here at the University of Nebraska and has taught several colleges in Nebraska. Senator Ebke, welcome. And then finally, Senator Adam Moorfield. Adam Moorfield was elected to represent District 46 in the Nebraska Legislature in 2014. He's an attorney and he's worked to protect voting rights and engage youth and veterans in the community. Senator Moorfield founded Nebraskans for Civic Reform, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to engaging youth through the substantive community service and leadership programs while still as an undergraduate in 2008. Thank you so much for your time, Senator Moorfield. Welcome. <laughs> Okay, let's get down to it. So we, we, we prepared a couple of questions, but again, if you have anything that provokes uh, something inside you and you would like to write it down, feel free to write it down. But I'm going to begin, uh, get them all warmed up. So here's a question to all of you panelists. How have you used social media and technology to, res to accomplish results for, for you in your public career? How do you see yourself doing it in the future? And for you two senators up here, how, do you, how have you used it during your campaigns now that they've kind of wrapped up? Did it help? Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. So who wants to go first? I'll start with you since okay. you're the closest. Okay. Um, well, I, I think that you know on the campaign side, um, and and I'm a I'm a big proponent of newspapers, but I realized at the end um, I hadn't spent a dime on newspaper advertising. Um, and in fact, it was all direct mail. I don't know if it's the same for you. It might be a little bit different. You have some more rural communities, um, but. Uh, my, mine's a very urban district, so it's Northeast Lincoln and the University and downtown Lincoln. And, and toward the end, I, I realized that all of my budget had been spent on um, direct mail, um, primarily actually, and then also um, online Facebook ads that were targeted to certain zip codes within my district. Um, and I felt like that was, um, even for um, the, I would say the 40 and above demographic, I felt as though we were getting lots of impressions and hits um, enough to be effective um, even on Facebook. And so uh, we decided not to use um, newsprint ads. And, and part of that goes counter to what I believe, and I sit on the board of the Daily Nebraska, and we see declining revenues and ads, and we have, you know, the costs are pretty stagnant, they, they've stayed the same. And so, um, one of my big fears is that we don't have, um, that we're not going to have responsible journalism um, that um, is accountable and fact-checked. 
But in order to do that, um, we have to have newspapers that have a business model. I'm going kind of off, off track here, but you know, as far as how I use social media, um, you know, we, we use Twitter, Facebook. I probably spend a thousand or two thousand dollars in Facebook ads. Don't quote me on that. It's on our NADC report that's starting to come out. So it's somewhere around that. Um, but uh, um, we used a lot of social media and Twitter. And I think that it was interesting when I was going door to door, there was a lot of people saying, oh, yeah, I saw that on Facebook or I saw your for this on a Facebook ad or something like that. And um, so it was the word was really getting out um, via Facebook, which surprised me a little bit after the campaign. Um, you know, we took a kind of a leap of faith by spending that much money, but I think the next campaign, um, you know, hopefully in four years, um, we're going to spend a lot more money on social media um, and maybe even Google ads and things like that, which we didn't use on this campaign. Um, as far as moving forward, um, you know, for several of our initiatives, um, a piece of legislation I'm going to be introducing next week. Um, I'm going to be doing targeted Facebook ads again. I'm letting them know that I'm a proponent on this issue. Please come and support. Like this link, you know, follow this issue. Um, we spent a lot of money on a really good website um, because a lot of people, they don't come down to your office anymore or even right into your office, they go to your website. Um, so we spent several thousand dollars on um, a website that's much better than the legislative ones that were provided. It doesn't even have a Twitter or a Facebook link on there. Um, and I think we have to go through somebody to even put content up. So I don't know if it's censored or something. But um, in any case, uh, uh, so I, I guess for me, I, I'm going to be investing heavily in activating folks that maybe I didn't meet at the door, but would be activated on a specific issue that hopefully, uh, number one, they'll go out and do something on that issue and, and contact other senators. And then number two, hopefully they'll follow and engage in the election in, in four years or in two years. So. We did a lot of the same things that Adam did. Um, we did do a little bit more print ads at the end because I have something like seven or eight small town mm -hmm. newspaper papers, and they're just weekly, so and we could do that relatively inexpensively. But social media-wise, um, we did a lot of Facebook, Twitter type of things. Um, I was posting on there. Um, personally, just about every day we used Facebook events and made sure that, and then, then we would use um, we would use ads to promote those events. So when we did meet and greets or meet the candidates, or um, we were going to be at a at a particular event for for one reason or another, we would post those as well. Um, I um, also engaged a, a number of um, a number of people online, encouraged them to you know to ask a question and say, what do you think of this? Um, I continue to do that. Um, I've switched over from my campaign page to, a, to, to, to an official Facebook page, and um, I'm posting all of my votes online with explanations. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in transparency and, and the power of the second house, and so um, it's been good for me so far. Um, I haven't done anything. You know, there's always there's always some peril with Facebook, as we were talking a little bit ago. Um, you know, you, you never know when you might let something out that, you know, maybe wasn't such a good idea. So far, I, I don't think I have, but we certainly, um, we certainly are trying to, you know, stay as accessible and open as we can. Um, we had something like 1,500 followers on my Facebook, my, my campaign Facebook page initially. Some of those are getting moved over. They haven't all made the switch to the, to the official page. That's really what we anticipate. Continuing to do that way is to, to engage online in addition to you know, face to face. It's fascinating to hear me, or to hear you talk about it that way. Because to me, with Politifact, when we built Politifact, it was 2007. Um, I registered a, a Twitter account for Politifact that has a really low user number and, and you know, the scope of the of the site. So it's, I think we registered it probably. September 2007-ish, and um, nobody knew what Twitter was or really cared. They were just, it was this kind of thing that tech nerds were really excited about, but at that point it wasn't, you know, capital T Twitter that we, we know of today. So nobody on the PolitiFact staff really wanted to do anything with it. And I'm, I'm trying not to give away what I'm going to talk about later on, but um, nobody really wanted to do anything with it. So I wrote a, a script that would take the headlines of things that we had fact-checked and just kind of pumped it into Twitter. And we got about 300 followers that way, and we thought, hey, awesome. we got 300 people that want to interact with our stuff. And around at the times of the, of the presidential debates, I, I got on the account 
first time a human being had actually logged onto the account in the seven or eight months that we had been using it and kind of like, hey, is this thing on? Um, I'm going to live tweet this debate and just tweet out things that we'd already fact checked. Anybody want that? A bunch of people said, yeah, 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 I'd really do that. What was fascinating to me was in the hour and 40 minutes or so of the debate that went on, we went from 300 followers to 3,000 followers. Um, that it really showed me that there was a hunger and a thirst for this kind of information on social media where it is coming to you and you're not forced to go find out about this. So it, it's, it's fascinating for me to, to, to listen to you talk about Facebook ads and targeting advertising and, and the kind of balance between uh, print and, um, and, and online. My, my father was on the school board in, in Blair, Nebraska for years and years and years. And I think the only ads that he ever made were newspaper ads and they were pictures of his grandkids as babies that just said, vote for my pop pop. And <laughs> it was about as, as yeah. it's, <laughs> maybe that one for free. Um, uh, so that was about as sophisticated as he got with it. Um, now to hear you know, about targeting, because it, it's all fascinating to me because back in the day, we never even anticipated having to fact check things that were on Facebook. Like that just didn't occur to us uh, in 2007. And now it's probably 50, you know, Maybe half of the things that come to PolitiFact are through Facebook, so mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a, a massive shift between just a few years ago and now. I just had a quick follow-up question. You struck a chord a little bit in how you talked about how there's kind of a new era of journalism and that there really isn't much of one. And even can you? Uh, I wanted to reach out to you, Matt, and then you as well. Um, what do you think of the, is the future of, of journalism, and how does? What are you telling your students as they? You know, go into that because I believe journalism is a calling. Personally, I think not everybody, you know, follows that. But uh, how do you see things changing? It is. Uh, it is a calling. It, it the things you see and the things you do and the, and the kind of experiences you have, you gotta want to do it. You really do. But I'm I'm more of a glass half full guy. Um, by the way, I'll be seeing you on the pub board here starting. Oh, uh, great! Yeah. Yeah. Place. So, yeah, looking forward to serving. Um, um, I, I, I honestly think that this is now the ideal time to be a journalist because we're entering uh, a Wild West phase. The old models are, are burning down, and they're, they're burning down around the years of people who don't want them to burn down, and you can fight against that or you can do something about it. Uh, unfortunately, too many publishers in the world have just tried to hold on as long as they can and, and not actually do the things necessary. Um, several of whom I've worked for. Um, I honestly believe that we are witnessing the emergence of uh, a new structure and a new form for media. I don't believe that journalism is going to go away. I think the need for it is as much now as ever, if not more so, because of the absolute deluge of information that just is, is fire hosed at you every day. Um, I mean, even even on my Facebook news feed, and my friends know who I am, what I've done, and my personal feeling about really unverified and complete BS. And yet, they still post it, knowing that I'm sitting there ready to go, like, mm. and so it gets out there. And, and, and I was asked this question earlier, like, so how has social media affected politics and affected free speech? And I'm like, it's the greatest and the worst thing ever. Um, information can get out at light speed. That is both terrible and wonderful. Uh, great information can get out at light speed. Terrible, wrong, uh, manipulative information can get out at the same light speed. And um, Churchill joked long ago that you know the, the truth barely gets its pants on once a lie has gone halfway around the world. I think that lie has gone several times around the world now. It's, it's just only increased. Um, but I, I tell my students, are you going to go have a 45-year-long career at the Metro Daily? Nope, probably not. Um, I would be willing to bet you that a lot of these Metro Dailies aren't going to be around for in 10 years. But does that mean that there's going to be no marketplace for good journalism in those cities? <coughs> absolutely not. There's absolutely going to be something, and something will rise from those ashes. And I believe it will be ultimately better. 
but we're going to go through some really dark times before then. And, and if you're looking for a stable career, I encourage you to look into insurance. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about social media and, and open government. Um, you know how, how it's got its, its good things and its bad things. Let's talk about one of the good things in, in that. Uh, you know how can we use social media and government to expand opportunities in our society for for some of those that are, are more marginalized and uh, maybe less fortunate or underserved in our community. Who wants to go first? You know I think. Uh, I, I read that question because uh, you guys sent it to me and I was thinking about it um, a few days ago and I think about, I mean, before I before I came to the legislature I was a voting rights advocate and I, I still consider myself that way, just in a different role now. And um, as far as, as communities that are marginalized, I guess, you know, for us when we were working on voting rights issues and down at the Capitol and, and bringing folks down, I think what we saw more is that a lot of folks um, who didn't have a lot of money actually now have good access, in many cases, um, to cheap forms of communication and information. So information now is a lot cheaper, which is a bad problem for newspapers uh, because they can't make money off it now. And it creates concerns for me because I think we have less long-form, responsible, in-depth journalism coverage. But there's also this thirst for immediate information. and. When I tell my people, when I tell the folks that work for me and my nonprofit, we do not do blog posts more than three paragraphs. People won't read it. And, and um, you know, we, we do links in those blog posts um, to give them more information for the people that do want more information and because I think it's responsible to provide the sources. Um, but I think to answer your question, I'm going a little bit off here, but to answer your question, I think that what we're seeing now is information is so cheap and so accessible that I think that, and I don't have any data to back this up, um, but just from the communities that I've worked with that are lower income, um, I see that a lot of them are getting their information and our calls to action, um, you know, using those different forms of digital communication, which I think is encouraging and, and good. Um, and I, I think that that's a, that's a good benefit of having cheap and kind of widely accessible information. Um, but beyond that, I haven't looked into it a little bit more, so I don't know, maybe the professor at Laura has. Laura, your answer to it. Well, you know, I don't, I don't know, uh, again, I, you know, I, don't, I don't know that I have data, but it's, it's yeah. more of a sense about this, but um, the fact that social media is, um, as a general rule, free, um, if you, you know, I mean, if you've got, as long as you've got you internet, if, yeah. as long as you've got internet access, and, and, you know, whether it's via phone or via, um, you know, via Wi-Fi at home or, or whatever, or going to the public library and, and accessing. I mean, yeah. there's, there's lots of there's lots of routes in um, to social media. So um, I do think that the possibility exists for more people to be involved and engaged through social media than maybe before. Um, I had a lot of interaction with people on my Facebook page who um, I had. But you have a variety of people who contact you via Facebook, but, but, a lot, but a lot of them, I would argue, you know, may have come from some of those more marginalized communities, people that you wouldn't necessarily think would, would be so engaged, but, but they felt comfortable accessing um, through social media, through something a little less intimidating where, you know, and, and so um, they may not have been reading so much in the paper or they may have been reading, um, you know, seen a little bit on, on broadcast television, but, but they were following what I was saying and then asking questions based on, um, so I don't, I don't know. I, I think social media is, is the wave of the future and I think it's a good thing. Um, I, I, you know, I, now that you bring it up, I can't tell you how many people contacted me just through Facebook Messenger. They just looked, looked my name up, and it wasn't even through my campaign. It was just my personal Facebook account, and messaged me real quick. And because it's it's quick, it's easy. You don't have to print it off. You don't. It's you know it's a more informal but effective mode of communication. And in fact, it's a lot easier for me to respond. Um, I have to budget a little bit more time to pick up the phone, go on a call that may or may not last you know 10, 15, 20 minutes. Whereas the, the conversation shorter, it's quicker, I understand their opinion and their point of view, and I can dig in a little bit more if I want to. A lot, a lot of times, it, if, you, if you look at this as a, as a technology problem, the, the marginalized communities are, are what's known as a last mile problem. Um, I, I can quote national statistics um, better than anything else. Um, 
And honestly, I think that the, the real future of communication with, with people is, is through mobile. Um, we're, if, if you think we're entering the mobile age, you're, you're, you're not paying attention. We're in the post-mobile era here. It's already happened. Uh, a lot of news organizations and their websites are actually seeing a majority of the traffic coming to them coming from mobile devices. Mm -hmm. People are spending more money on uh, smartphones and digital access uh, through their mobile devices than they are at home. So the problem is, in the United States, uh, we're at plus 90% cell phone penetration at this point. The smartphone penetration is only about 68%, though. So you have roughly 32% that don't have internet access through their phone, but they have text messages. Mm -hmm. So there is a underserved community of people who communicate largely through text messages that are not being reached through social media or uh, elements like that. Then it's about nine or 8% who don't have anything. And those are either the extremely poor or the very old. Um, my 91-year-old grandma is a Facebook junkie, <laughs> but she has to like print things off and bring them to her friends. Um, so it's that's the that's the last mile problem right there is, is people who are uncomfortable with technology or cannot who are living like meal to meal, uh, and that's the last mile problem there. All right, I got a question from the audience. Um, how do you gauge when social media ac activity actually means anything? You kind of touched on it a little bit as like an elected official, as a user, you know, what gets through to you, you know, and a plus like we also have other things to overcome. Like oh, I'm the internet tough guy, you know, the person that's always typing things on there. How do you kind of filter through all of that noise and, you know, talk about what what actually you know really gets through to you as an as an official? Gosh, that's a good question. Um, so far, I guess I haven't had, you know, I, I've had a lot of, you, you, get, you get barraged with, with things, um, and, and my sense is it's sort of a matter of when it hits critical mass. You know, one person who's, um, who is, is telling me something, you know, is, is something I kind of file away and listen to. When I get a bunch of people who are talking about the same thing, I, I'm a lot more um, in tune with it, I guess. So that's, you know, that's probably the best way for me, anyhow. Um, to judge, um, you know, how much attention I should be paying attention to this, you know, to this particular um, issue. Yeah, I mean, and I guess I haven't looked through it through a, a public official lens because I've been in the legislature for a whole three, three days, days now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not much happened other getting in our committee assignments and our offices, but um, but in any case, um, you know, from an advocate point of view, um, I've done a lot of advocacy in the legislature before coming here and. I think the challenge um, for a lot of officials is how much is this, how much of this information and this advocacy that's coming to me is it pushed by organizations that are just really good at activating people, and how much of it is the actual problem? That there's an actual problem, this is a groundswell. And you know, I've been on the other side where it's like we need to get a thousand emails <laughs> to ex senators, and we we've, we've done it before, and sometimes we haven't. Um, <laughs> But I, I've seen the other side of that. Um, now, that being said, just because you're able to get 1,000 emails and you have really organized opposition, that doesn't still mean that it's not an important issue either. Um, and that may be a good sign that it is an important issue because there are people and resources going into the issue because it is an important issue. But that being said, you have to sometimes discern, and what's the quality of the contact? You know, For me to get a letter with somebody's story in their medical bills saying, this is what I'm going through, this is how much I'm making. This is what your policy, your voting on has an impact. That's a lot more powerful than somebody sending me a, you know, a, a form email. Um, but I think that's the tough thing. I, I think that's the thing I'll have a tough time with because yeah. I've been on both sides now. So. And, and I think it's really exciting what the We Vote Project is doing because um, you can have that verification. So, yeah. um, you know, if you got, if, if you're bombarded by stuff, you know, I mean, I, there have been there have been some issues where you know I've gotten. Um, I've gotten 20 emails or messages on my Facebook page, and I start going through the names, and you got the voter database next to you, and it's like, well, one of them is in my district. Right. Ten uh, of them are in like Massachusetts. Yeah, <laughs> ten of them, are, or you know, Ogallala, or so, you know, someplace. Yeah. yeah. And so I think it's. Not that uh, Ogallala doesn't matter. Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> but uh, but you know, I think I think that, that, that what you guys are doing is a great thing from that standpoint because it does provide some verification and it puts you in, in direct contact with. 
um, with the people who, um, you know, who are going to vote for you the next time around. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you, but it's not a panacea. <coughs> um, I've, I've done a fair bit of consulting for media companies, and um, back in the late 2000s, a lot of them were really interested about uh, how do we improve comments on our websites? Most news organization comment sections are just a sewer of garbage. And, and they were getting increasingly concerned about it. It's still a concern. Well, when Facebook rolled out its commenting platform, a lot of news organizations like, great, we'll just get rid of it, and we'll put Facebook on there, and because people have to have their name and their face on there and their Facebook identity on there, it'll really clean things up. I said, you have one problem, and, and we both will have this problem, and you will have this problem as well. I will politely refer to it as the a-hole problem. <laughs> and <laughs> social media, there is social capital. Um, if you are a jerk, and your mother knows you're a jerk and loves you anyway, if your friends are like, yeah, that's bad, he's a jerk, but once you get past that, he's an okay guy. If your friends all accept you as a jerk, then there is absolutely zero social consequence to you being a jerk on a website. And you're just gonna be that way. You're gonna be you. So I love I love the fact that WeVote is actually making it so actual voters in a district are identified and those are the people that have that have been given the ability to comment. I think it will vastly raise the bar. But jerks are gonna get through. And they're going to be jerks, because that's what they do. Jerks will certainly get through, but um, it, it also makes it a lot easier that if you know that the, you're, they're in your district, yep. they <laughs> ask the person who lives next door to them yeah. and say, you know, what's the yeah. story with this guy? Oh, you know, and, and, okay. you know it, yeah. it, helps, it helps you to yeah. filter that out. I mean, jerks will be jerks in person. I can't yeah. tell you how I many yeah. people yeah. You know, chase me <laughs> off their <laughs> stoop or anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but but you know the, the thing is the anonymous nature. Yes. Particularly before Facebook started going out. But it's funny because you still see some of that. Oh, yeah. that kind well, of and, and, and the anonymous nature too. It goes back to the question you asked, like how do you know when how do you know when social uh, a social movement is actually a real movement? How how that online activity is going to translate into mm -hmm. into actual uh, real life events? How many of you were active on social during the 2008 presidential election? Ron Paul's president, right? Yes. No. <laughs> Spoiler alert, no. Um, if you had followed all of the online activity, if you were anywhere on social during the 2008 presidential election, you would have thought that we were going about to anoint Ron Paul King. That was a really, really noisy and organized movement of people online that vastly overstated their impact uh, electorally. And I think that's the real danger is to see social activism as real activism. That slacktivism of, of hashtag activism, it can get a lot of attention and then, eh. I mean, it's the reason why the, uh, it's the, reason why the, uh, the ice bucket challenge actually worked, because it required people to actually do something. Now, it was silly, but people actually had to do something in the physical world other than just slap a hashtag on a tweet and forget about it. So that's the that's the kind of real trick there is figuring out when is this going to actually bubble up into something in the actual world. Let me stay with you for a second, Professor Waite. I got another question from the audience, but earlier you mentioned um, the media being in the Wild West, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, how do you envision, uh, what do you envision that has to happen for us to end up with a, a civilized media in the digital age? Well, um, I know, I'm glad was, you're all sitting down. This is going to be about four hours <laughs> of lecture. So we're going to about 16 weeks of class. So um, no, uh, the very, 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 very quick version is we have to find a way to make uh, paying for content online work. Very simply, the way that we have uh, accounted for and paid for content online with advertising has to die. Um, the way that it works, and I'm going to try to do this as absolutely as fast as possible, it is a pay-per-view model. Uh, advertisers buy every thousand page impressions. And the way to make more money online is to have more traffic. The problem is there is an infinite supply of traffic on the internet, so there's no scarcity at all. So you get publishers playing games. 
Ever wonder why everything is a dang photo gallery and you gotta click on it 14 times to get through the list? That's because every one of those is a page view. That's another thing to go towards advertising. At the same time, advertisers have gotten smart. They set up these networks of buying. They don't care when and where this stuff goes, just that it's seeing enough people. What that's done is you have, I mean, go back to your basic economics. You have uh, infinite supply and pretty standard demand. What's going to happen? Price is going through the floor. Uh, where premium advertising rates back in the mid 2000s would be 20 bucks per thousand, you're now looking at more like 75, 80 cents per thousand. And so you get more publishers playing games, you have more people just trying to shovel content out there to get into the maw, you've got people using social to try to draw traffic to things. It's created this race for the bottom. That has to die. As soon as that dies, we can start having a responsible adult conversation about how to build a real model. But until that goes away, until people let that go, we how do you got kill it? It's going to die eventually. I mean, basically, it's going to come to the point where advertisers are going to realize it's worth it for me to not have ads on these pages than it is for me to have them. Mm -hmm. so if I can get one person to pay for all of the ads on these pages, in a, in, a, in a better sense than just having these network ads, these remnant ads, whatever you want to call them, that's when it's going to take. It's going to, we're going to hit an inflection point where not having ads will be more valuable than having them. And once that happens, things will start changing. Um, uh, something that somebody else said, and I'm trying to remember who it was, uh, it'll come to me later on. Um, they said something that was really brilliant, and that was, name one publisher that has a means for you to pay for the content that you're looking at that's as easy as getting Uber or purchasing something with PayPal. Go on, I'll wait. Um, it just doesn't exist. We haven't solved that problem. I mean, buying something on Amazon. Uh, once publishers can get into that era where it's, where it's frictionless, people can get the content that they want uh, that they desire, and the, there's zero pain in terms of paying for it, that will be a big change to it. Interesting. <laughs> Let's shift gears a little bit and talk uh, a little bit more about you know government and technology. Obviously, government doesn't handle technology very well. I can give you Exhibit A, healthcare.gov, um, <laughs> several others. The, the government just does not do technology well, like it or not. That's just kind of how it is. They have courses. I took one of my masters all about that. Um, but how do you see, in your opinion, where are the areas that the government could improve with technology, you know, and how can, you know, products like, you know, the We Vote Project and others really, you know, help improve um, engagement between, you know, ver you, you mentioned the verified user. That's huge because I had to answer phones in the Senate all the time. And I worked for a guy from Iowa, and I'd be getting calls from people from California that were nuts and would call <laughs> every single day at the same time and, and do that. So, so how, how do you guys see those things playing out? I have one very specific thing that I had that has absolutely made me furious in Nebraska that I think would make a major change to um, open government and how Nebraska's government deals with technology. There is a specific section of Nebraska's public records law that in so many words says if an agency publishes a record in a given form then that's the, re that's the way that they will provide it to you. Period, end of story. So what has been the result of that is a lot of agencies will take very valuable public data and they will put it in a multi-thousand page PDF document that is absolutely worthless. And they will put that online. And when you go to them and you say, you know, look, it is very obvious that you took a database dump and made it a PDF. Why don't you just give me the database, please? They say, no. We have published it as a PDF. It's online. Go there and get it. I have students have an assignment to go get data from a state agency. And they come back sputteringly angry because of these circular conversations that they have to have about this. And it is that one line of the public records law that allows them to do this. For instance, as an employee of this fine institution, my salary is a public record. The University of Nebraska system publishes all university salaries as a 2,400 page PDF. Yes, I've seen it. 
If you want to go find what I make, be my guest. Download that 22 meg sucker and start scrolling. I'm in the W's. You'll be there a while. <laughs> Actually, pro tip, hit control F or command F if you're on a Mac. Type in my last name, takes you right to it. Um, that's useless. That document is absolutely useless. And to be able to do anything useful, like analyze the growth of administrative salaries or faculty salaries or anything like that, do any sort of accountability uh, investigation with that, you have to go through a process that took my students roughly 12 hours to make that document into something useful. It, they're not alone. The University of Nebraska does not stand alone in this at all. They are. Uh, there are other agencies. It, it, it gets worse, actually, if you'll permit me a moment. <laughs> Elections could not be more fundamental to our democracy. Yes? Like, that is pretty much it. Elections, top of the heap. I had a data class. I, it was, it was um, the last Senate election. And I remembered Bob Kerry from my childhood and being governor. And I said, you know what? I think it would be interesting for us to look at how the Nebraska's electorate has changed since Bob Kerry last successfully ran for statewide office, compared to now. OK. So I sent a group of students to the Secretary of State to get the official canvas from 1990, help me out here, four was when he last ran for statewide office, uh, when he last ran for Senate. Um, and they said, OK, here's the PDF of it. The problem they had was they took the printed official canvas from 1994 and they ran it through a scanner. The type that they used to print a lot of the numbers in the document were very, very small, and the scanner that they used was very, very bad. So if you looked at this document, you had no way to tell a 5 from a 4, uh, an 8 from a 9. We were looking at these, and it was just like, anybody got any guesses? Is that a 9 or a 7? So essentially, under Nebraska's public records law, the 1994 election never happened. It is a complete mystery as to what happened, <laughs> other than who won, how they won, at what levels, what who, what was the registered voter counts in these counties. You tell me, man. I just work here. Uh, that's a problem. That's a significant problem. That if we just struck one line of the public records law, it would change a lot. Florida's public records law actually specifically requires governments to provide information electronically. And it even specifies if you can do nothing else, you have to you have to specify it as text, just plain text. That'll work for everybody. You don't gotta get fancy. If they use a specific outside vendor, that vendor must be able to provide electronic information on demand to a citizen on a public records request. Nebraska has none of that. None of it. We really desperately need. If I could add something, just <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I've had that bottle up. No, like I just oh, had to do a. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think Senator Epke and I just found a piece of legislation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there you go. Easy, take black pen. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to, you know, kind of reiterate your point. And, you know, and user reference for one of my favorite uh, Washington <laughs> D.C. shows, which is the show Veep. I don't know if anybody's seen it on HBO. Yeah. Probably the most accurate portrayal of really how it, it is out there. But there was a scene <laughs> that always sticks out to me in that uh, they're trying to hide something, and they said. You know what? You, you, you could hide the documents, or the other strategy people in DC do is publish everything. You know, and then nobody's going to really go through and do that. Yeah, the, da the data dump. Yeah. And you know, one of the nicest things that I believe that the administration has done so far uh, in my area of expertise in healthcare is that they actually have allowed transparency for Medicare payment pricing. Uh, which is a huge deal, a huge problem, because in cities like here, uh, you could go and get this, have 20 different charges for this for the same procedure, and just by, you know, releasing that data, Silicon Valley, the hottest thing to be is somebody going through through that data and, and figuring out ways to get price transparency out there, and so. Uh, I think, uh, you know, making moves like that is really important. There's all kinds standpoint. of things that could be done with public data that could improve life in cities. Uh, open access to crime data might reveal things that the police didn't see. Just, just uh, by for another anything, right, just, yeah. just didn't see it. Um, having uh, one of my favorite uh, examples is a group of, of developers here 
uh, got the health department to give them restaurant inspections data, and they put it in a map. And you can type the restaurant you're going to, and you can see what the health department has to say about it, which sometimes changes your idea, you know, changes what you want to do. That kind of that kind of disclosure is going to put pressure upon restaurateurs to be smarter about uh, health uh, codes and what they do, and, and it's going to put a little more pressure on those on those uh, on those inspections. But anybody in here not in favor of that? Anybody here want to eat dirty, terrible food? No. Uh, um, there's all kinds of things that with a group of civic-minded developers would gladly make that information useful and for free. Yeah, Senator. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I've actually heard that from a lot of my friends kind of in the data world mm -hmm. that, um, you know, the fact that we just still put out PDFs and, and, and a lot of people, you know, what's interesting is a lot of these um, state agency administrators or local level administrators um, you know, that's a new concept to them yep. in of itself. And they're putting stuff on the website. They think that they're doing pretty good, actually. Yep. And, and, you know, so that they go into it with a, you know, um, with, with a good mindset, but they don't understand that the data, particularly the massive amount of data that they're providing on there, really isn't useful in a PDF format. I mean, the other thing, too, is, and this is an issue that I'll work on, and, and hopefully with Senator Kittner and, and FK, is, is making the website, our Nebraska legislative website, just a lot more user friendly. I mean, it takes seven clicks to like find your senator, and then go look at the bill, and then click on the bill to see what it's for, and then see the sponsors. That's one thing that I really like about the platform that you guys just showed. But, um, you know, go, go to Utah's legislative website. Um, it's amazing. And not only that, you can find all the video of um, the debate on that that top on that bill um, in the past, and you can see where your senators were on um, with that, um, and then you can actually go into some committee hearings on those too. Um, but in any case, I, I think that we can do a lot better as a legislative branch in bringing the website um, really to the you know the 21st century. Um, and you know, at the time when they created the website, I talked to a few people. You know, it was actually a, a pretty good website. You know, 10 or 15 years ago, but um, in any case, um, I think that there's ways that we can make um, government a lot more accessible in that sense, so that it's easy to find where your senator stands on an issue. Um, you can hold them accountable. Um, and then the other thing, too, is you know, with the Secretary of State's office, I mean, it took us seven years to get them to do online voter registration. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I actually have a lot of respect for John Gale. He's a good guy, our Secretary of State. But I remember sitting down with them eight years ago and saying, you know, there's this great thing that Arizona's been doing at that time for about seven years. It's called online voter registration. He's like, I'm not so sure about the internet. I'm like, <laughs> what part of what, what part about it? Like, the, that it's going to be there? Or I mean, and so for seven years, I mean, we we were going on, and finally there was one year we didn't inter have a bill introduced, and he introduced it, and and suddenly, I mean, I so I don't know if that was a trick. We just need to stop trying to do it ourselves. But um, you know, so we'll have online voter registration, but why can't we request a vote by mail ballot online too, using the same system, actually? Much more secure than our current form of registration um, because it requires you know certain things to get to the DMV database and to fill that out. But in any case, um, you know I think that there's a lot of things that we can do um, to make government more accessible and to make the processes whether it's registering to vote or requesting to vote by mail or um, you know finding out what your senator is introducing or where they stand. When you're done there, the Nebraska Accountability and Disclosure Commission. That's awful. It's truly dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> What is a monument to awful? Yeah. But we'll have to talk. Yeah. yeah. Why is it so? I mean, do you think it's mindset? I mean, what do you think they just don't even, you know, care about I think resources? I think, it, I think it's that? the way that they've just been doing things. There is a lot of resistance to change. Yeah. In in bureaucracies and agencies, even even in the administrations I liked more, and the administrations, I mean, it both. I mean, there are folks there that have been doing things for so long. And if you ask them to do something a different way, even if it's more efficient and it saves money, which oftentimes a lot of these things do, they will come down on you like the force of God. And I've seen it happen in committee hearings time after time. So <laughs> something I teach my I don't students. Know if you have I teach my students all the time. You yeah, never ascribe to malice what can be just what can be explained by <laughs> well, it comes to mind about accountability and disclosure. So much of that stuff you, you can fill out online. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's no reason why you know we have to do the, the PDF versions, and then you know, um, yeah. it would be 
much easier and, and accessible if you just left it in, in, in data form. Just a, just a bulk download link. Yeah. That's all I want. <laughs> well, uh, as here it comes. I'll, as deal, a, I'll deal with the problem later. Yeah, okay. as, as a political scientist who, who did a dissertation that was heavy in, 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 in data, you know, I, I really appreciate the availability of the data and not having it available has frustrated me to no end in the Nebraska legislature uh, as a member of the legislature, but my pre legislative days, because we would, um, you know, I would try to find out, okay, how did somebody vote on, you know, LB 18 or whatever? And, you know, trying to find that is virtually impossible, yeah. you know, especially if you go back mm -hmm. beyond the most recent, the recent day, you know? Yeah. What, one other thing, too, is, um, you know, I was just in a, I got on the education committee and found out that two days ago. So we had a we had a meeting, you know, yesterday, and, and we're talking about the Tiosa formula. And if anybody knows anything about, does anybody, has everybody, anybody ever heard of Tiosa in here? Okay, it's the education formula, and you know, it, it's very complex. It has a lot of different factors. About a million different data points is what they told me. Different factors is, is what the legal counsel told us. And one of the things that baffled me though is that. Uh, one of the new senators, who was a superintendent, said, is there any way that we can do projections based on what we're proposing in legislation to change the formula and what, what kind of impact that would have? And they just started laughing. And they're, I mean, apparently, um, and I don't know much about that. I mean, I'm new to the new to the committee and everything. You know, apparently, you, you introduce a bill and you could have a hearing on it, but you wouldn't actually know what the financial impact is. It's just kind of guesstimates. Um, and, and because you have to go through the Department of Education, they have to run all these different analysis and all that. And I don't know. I'm not a I'm not a that big of a data guy to know what it takes. But it's kind of like you know, as as policymakers, you know, if I want to tweak the formula somehow, but I don't know what the actual impact is going to be, and I can't run a, a simulation on what that looks like based on the current revenues and things like that. I mean, I. I don't know. That kind of baffles me, but it's it's things like that that we have to that that would save us a lot of money in the long run and, and be able to have you know informed policy debate. Did you have another thought, Professor? No. Okay. All right. Got time for one more question, then we're gonna take an adjournment uh, for lunch. It's been a pretty thought-provoking discussion so far. I'm gonna try and combine these two if I can. Um, number one is you know as we look at uh, the role of lobbyists and special interests. Um, what what they should have as a role in public policy, what do they not? Uh, do you think that uh, lobbying and, and that type of thing is going to be going up or going down? Are there going to be, or do you think it's going to be with this digital era more of uh, individuals as lobbyists as opposed to joining as a group? And then second part uh, of the question for our senators is how do you plan to collect and respond to constituent communications? Do you have a system in place? Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's kind of a lot of loaded questions. Um, I, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think, uh, I personally think, and I, I guess I don't know, I, 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 when, when I was an advocate and I guess a, a nonprofit lobbies for our organization's interests, um, it was always during kind of the digital age, you know, so it was, you know, from 2005 until now. So I don't know what it was like to before necessarily, and other people may have more um, thoughts on that, more experience. I, I guess for me, um, it's just a lot easier to get in touch with your elected official as they're listening. Um, if they're checking their email or if they're checking their Facebook and, and they care about those different issues. So um, I think it's, there's a lot more different modes of communication and access to your elected official, which I think is a good thing. Um, I don't know how it changes lobbying necessarily. I mean, lobbying, I think, is a lot about building trust and relationships with senators. But then also, just sometimes, I mean, I come in with some issues that are just no, not really, they're not going to be swayed on, you know? And and, um, and I'm sure, you know, Senator Epke and Senator Kittner um, are on the same page because, you know, we have certain thoughts and ideology. But um, so I don't know really the answer to the question as far as constituent contact. I mean, our system is, is if I get a constituent contact through Facebook, email, um, letter, or whatever the case is, is you know I, I respond personally. And then if I don't know the answer right away, I assign it to one of my legislative staff, and then we follow up. And, and they're in charge of making sure that I remember to follow up, and, and we're researching the issue and providing whatever service we can. So. Yeah, our, our process is very much the same. Um, you know, you ask, for a political scientist, this is all sort of a metaphysical question almost. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that uh, 
you know, lobbyists are always going to be with us, you know, <coughs> and um, so so we're going to have to deal with that. You know, I like the idea of citizen lobbyists being more engaged. Um, unfortunately, um, if if the citizens aren't engaged, um, you know, the, the non-paid lobbyists, if you will, then the paid guys will be will be there, um, mm -hmm. and sometimes they'll be representing the or saying that they're representing the citizen lobbyists. Yeah. yeah. So that 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 that's certainly a problem um, or maybe just a fact of life. Uh, so um, I think the important thing for us to remember and to keep in mind as we go through all of this is that, um, that, that, that ultimately it's the second house we've got to turn our, our you know, as legislators that we've got to turn back to. And um, you know, one of the things that I've done throughout my campaign and I've tried to do um, in the three days that I've been in office, um, certainly since the, in the two months that I've been elected, um, it is, to, is to be accountable, to be accessible. Um, I, we respond to all emails and, and, um, and, and Facebook messages. Don't do them as quickly as we did for a while. Sometimes it takes a little bit of, a, a little bit of time before I get them. We just got our email up and running. So <laughs> I, I opened my, my email box the other day and there were like 20 emails that had already come in but I hadn't had access to it yet. So um, we are working our way through that. Um, and you know, I would encourage citizens to just stay active and be accountable, you know, hold us accountable. Um, that's an important part of the, the process. Mm -hmm. Final thoughts? No? no I, work in the, work I don't have to answer emails from constituents. Oh, okay. I thank God every day. <laughs> <laughs> the students are bad enough. <laughs> well, um, any final remarks, panelists, or where can the audience find out uh, more about you and you know your Website, Facebook page, anything like that? AdamWarfield.com. Um, LauraFP.com. <laughs> um, Facebook page is Senator Laura FP. Twitter is Sen Laura FP. I read shorten that one, so um, you can find me out there. How about Thank you? you. Same, MattWaite.com. MattWaite.com. All right. <laughs> Let's get a great round of applause for our. For our like it's lunchtime, right? And if you guys want to come down here and go around to get your food and come back through the end, that way we won't uh, interrupt the program. We're going to take a couple minute time out and then I will be uh, right back with uh, our next speaker. Yeah. 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 Yeah.